O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take us home, what joy shall fill our hearts. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. How great thou art, how great thou art. going to be in Judges chapter 7. And we're going to study a quite interesting chapter and I wish there's more people here to listen and hear it. But evidently we're the ones who need it. You know, uh, a lot of people when they uh, are called to serve God, one of the first uh, inclinations they have is they think, well, how could God use somebody like me? And the problem with our understanding is that we think God could never use somebody like us, and we think that we're just too small, we're insufficient. Remember when God called Moses. Moses gave excuses. He said, Lord, you know that I can't speak and I can't, I can't do these things, you know, that I'm, I'm just not that way and I can't do it. And uh, the Lord said, okay, if you can't do that, then I'll, I'll help you out. I'll appoint somebody. But really, the, the, the way that it is, is that when it comes to serving God, it's not that we're too little, it's that we're too big. Now, that's something that we really have to ponder. Because in our minds, even though we think, well, Lord, how could you use me? We still have so many characteristics of where we think, well, you know, I'm, I'm this and I'm that, and I can do this, and I've had success in other places in my life. And even though we, we realize that uh, we're not sufficient for what God wants us to do, when we really come to understand the truth, we realize that God's not looking for big people. God's looking for little people. And I'm not talking about big in the sense of how tall or how strong or whatever you are. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Remember Brother Clarence Walker had a brother named Walter. And Walter was, uh, he had a hair lip when he was born. And he uh, he always had difficulties, and uh, he used to always, I, I heard Brother Walker say that Walter used to say that he wanted to be small enough for God to use him. 
and he, he had a sermon that he preached on the fact that we are too big for God to use us and if we truly want to be used by God, we have to be small. We have to be surrendered. Because listen, the power is not in the preacher. The power is not in the people. The power is in God. And He's the one who's to be glorified. You know, if you take a man gets up and he preaches this great sermon and, and he's got all these different abilities, you know, to speak and so forth and we think wow what a sermon that was but you take a man who uh, maybe not have much education but he knows Christ and he gets up and speaks and you think wow God really used that man you think about how small he was and yet the words he spoke had such power because he was depending upon God not upon his flesh and I've had times like that in my life when, you know, I would spend maybe 25 hours on a sermon. And when I got up to preach, I thought, Lord, I'm just so prepared. I've got all my notes. I've got everything, all my illustrations. I've got my sermon. And I'd get up and just fall flat on my face. And then times when I would think I'm ill-prepared. I, I haven't done enough study. I haven't done enough prayer. And yet I get up and God blesses and does things that was never done when I thought I was so prepared and I was so ready. Because there's an element of trust in God and His bigness and realizing that really, no matter how big we are, we're nothing. And He's everything. Now that's the lesson we're going to learn here. We're going to learn that uh, God works through small people and small numbers. Remember our Lord said, Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And a lot of times people think, Well, if you don't have this big old church with five or six hundred people, you're not doing anything or you're not accomplishing anything but in reality, down through the centuries, it's been only a handful of people in churches that God used to do some of the greatest work that's ever been done. Amen. The Bible says now in verse number 1, then Zerubbabel, who is Gideon, knows he gives him another name, Zerubbabel, and uh, that name honors God and all the people that were with him, rose early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And, on, and the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee, notice this, are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Too many people. And there he says, Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, the Lord talks about love. And he says, Love vaunteth not itself, Amen. and is not puffed up. When we vaunteth or vaunt ourselves, we are building ourselves up, we are, are gloating in what we can accomplish and what we can do, and normally all that stuff just simply falls into the dirt and is useless. Amen. And the Lord said, there are too many of you, I'm going to have to cut the number down. And he goes on in verse 3, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. So they had in the beginning 32,000, and 22 of those, 22,000 of them, return because he said if you're fearful and you doubt 
and you're afraid, go ahead and go back home. We don't need you. Now that's a big that's a big number. I mean, they're facing uh, they're fa- the number of the Midianites, as we're going to see here in a little bit, is so many they can't even number them. They just say that their camels are like the sand of the of the desert. They couldn't be numbered. So you can imagine how many there were. There were not only the Midianites, but they had various other groups that joined with them against Israel. So the first accounting, the Lord takes them down and gets rid of 22,000 people in doing His work. Now notice it goes on and says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Now just imagine that. Let's say you were Gideon, and you've got 32,000 people ready to go to battle. And now you you announce to all the men that if you're afraid, you're doubtful, and you don't really have the courage to go into this battle, you all just go on home. And you watch them as they turn around and walk away, and they keep going away and going away and going away and going away, and finally you're you're down to 10,000. Now you've you've lost about a third of all your men. Maybe even more, maybe two thirds, I guess, yeah. And you're down to ten thousand, and then and after you see only that small number, the Lord says to Gideon, still too many. I'm not going to deliver it into your hand because you're too big. Because what are you going to do? Well, if you win the battle, you're going to, you're going to gloat in yourself. You're going to you're going to talk about how you won the battle. You know. It's amazing you listen to people talk about the Lord and, uh, and to see many times how we get caught up in glorifying ourselves. You know, people talk about getting saved. They'll say, you know, I got saved. Or they'll, they'll put the emphasis on themselves when it ought to be in the New Testament. It's the Lord saved. The Lord saved me. I didn't save myself. I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. I was dead in trespasses and sins. And He quickened me. It was all of grace. Now, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. The more than I got saved, you know, all I knew is I was a sinner needed a Savior. And the Bible says, the Lord says, yet you got too many. The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water. And I will try them. For thee there, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. In other words, the Lord is saying, Whatever I say, that's going to be the rule. You obey me, you do what I tell you to do, and I'm going to bless you. You know, that's the difficult challenge we have today is we have to do God's work God's way. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like to take a stand for truth. They don't want to take a stand for the the Word of God, the doctrines of the Word of God. They're they're ashamed, it's almost like, you know, uh, to say, well, this is what I believe and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm a Baptist. God made me a Baptist because the Baptists that I've associated with believe the Word of God. They stand for the truths of the Bible. I've uh, been associated with different churches through my life, and I found out very soon that uh, there was only a few that were actually preaching the Bible and teaching salvation by grace through faith in Christ. We were watching an old gun smoke um, uh, episode and they had this minister on and the guy said, what stripes are you? Oh, I have no stripes. We're just all ministers. We're all the same, he said. And uh, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't tell them what he was. Folks, don't you know there's a difference in your stripes? Your stripes determine what your doctrinal beliefs are and what you stand for. 
And we all know that as time goes by, uh, I'm going to be gone, uh, and you're going to have to call another pastor someday. And when you do, you make sure that you call a man who loves the Word of God and loves the truth and stands for the truth. Make sure that you do that because maybe many of you that are here tonight who will be responsible for that. And so the Lord goes ahead and He tells them, we're going to break it on down. And uh, He goes in verse uh, 4, The Lord said to Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down to the water. Now why is He going to take them to the water? Well, because at the water He's going to prove something that is of tremendous importance. Because He wants men who are alert and prepared for battle. So what he does, he tells Gideon, I want you to go down to the water, and I want you to watch as the men come to drink. And notice he says uh, in verse 5, So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. So let's break this down first. He says there are going to be two categories. There's going to be one group who's going to come down, and they're going to be alert and attentive. They may scoop the water up in one hand and lap it while they're looking around for the enemy. They may take both hands and get the water and lap it, and they're looking for the enemy. Some may even lap it while they're looking around, but there will be some who will get on their knees, and they will actually stick their face in the water, and they will drink the water without being conscious of the enemy that is all around them. Remember, the Midianites were just to the north. So at any moment there could be an attack. And the Lord wants to see who is vigilant, who is alert, and who is aware. Remember what Jesus said in relation to His coming? He says, be you sober, be vigilant. Because uh, actually Peter said, for your adversary the devil uh, goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You have to be vigilant. You have to be alert. And the men who just fell down on their knees and then collapse into the water and begin to suck up the water, put them aside. So you've got two groups. And you can imagine as Gideon's standing there watching them, and they have some of the men are saying, okay, you go over here, and you go over here, and you go here. And then all of a sudden on one side, you've got a whole bunch, and then over here you've only got 300. And Gideon's saying, well, surely the Lord's going to say, send the 300 and then take this group. But no. Notice verse 5 says, he brought them down, the people under the water. The Lord said to Gideon, every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shall they set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lap, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his own place. The Lord tested them. And by their test, was the way that he chose. I was reading an illustration, and uh, uh, I believe it was Gill, maybe another writer had it in his notes, and he said that there were a group of young men who were all straight-A students, and uh, their final exam was going to be on a Monday morning, and they were going to have some time off, so they went up to a big party, and all of them began to drink, and 
they got uh, drunk and then on Monday they had a bad headache and they couldn't go into class and so on Tuesday they went to the professor and they all made up this big story and they said well we were headed up this way and we had a flat tire and we couldn't get help and so our car was stuck and we couldn't get to class and the professor said okay he said we'll, we'll give you a final test so the next day they came in, the first question he gave them was worth 5%, and they thought, wow, this is going to be easy. And then they turned the page over and it said, this question will be worth 95%. Which tire on the car was flat? Well, they flunked it, all of them. You know, God has ways of testing us and people think that they can, you know, just sort of fake it and, and, and so forth. But God knows your heart. And God knew the hearts of these men. And He chose the man, the men, that He knew would be alert and attentive and ready for the battle. So the Bible says in verse 8, The people took victuals in their hands and their trumpets. Notice that. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man into his tent, and retained there those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Purah, thy servant down to the host. Notice how the Lord's testing Gideon. He says, if you're still afraid and you don't trust me, I'm, I'm going to show you something else. Go down with Pura. And Pura's going to lead you somewhere and there you're going to find something out. Now notice. And thou shalt hear what they say and afterwards shall thine hand, hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Pura, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as a sand by the sea side for multitude. Now you can only imagine there was perhaps 50,000, 100,000 we don't really know, but God just says it was a, an incredible number. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow. He said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and came unto a tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it that the tent lay alone. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. Now notice in the dream of these men, they still don't give God the glory. They say that he's going to deliver by Gideon, but really it's not the hand of Gideon, it's the hand of God as we're going to see. And it was so in verse 15 when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. Now let's kind of bring things down to earth for a minute. We're all weak. We're all frail. And sometimes we think, boy, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm brave and I'm strong and all that. But there will be times when you will go through trials and difficulties that will absolutely bring you to your knees. And God has a way of encouraging you. I, it, it may not be a dream. It, it may be something that He touches in your heart. It may be something that He shows you. It may be an illustration that He proves in front of your face. I remember one time we were, we were in a really terrible difficult time and I was at a hospital visiting this little girl came through the hospital room and 
and she was extremely ill. She had tubes all over her body, and you know, she was just so sick. And she looked at me, and it was almost like an angel looking at me. And she came, to, she asked her mom to bring her directly to me. And she put her little hand on my hand, and she said, I've prayed for you. And it just, I mean, it literally just made me feel the presence of God in such a way that this little child out of nowhere just came up and said, I'm praying for you. I don't know how God will do that for you, but I know He'll do it. He does it in many different ways. And Gideon needed encouragement. He needed someone uh, uh, to say something that would lift his spirits, that would give him encouragement to serve God and to be faithful. And the Bible says, as we look at the rest of the chapter, in verse number 13, when he was come down, he heard the man's dream. In verse 14, his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon. Verse 15, And it was all so... When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, what did he do? He worshipped. And he returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hands the host of Midian. He got an encouraging word. Remember when David was running for his life and his son Absalom was threatening to kill him. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes I talk to myself. Sometimes I say, Tony, why don't you straighten up and get your heart back where it needs to be? And, you know, we all, we all at times doubt. We all at times think, well, Lord, why, why do I have to keep on fighting? Why do I have to keep on pushing? Why can't I just relax? Why can't I just let somebody else do the work? And the Lord says, look, that time will come. But now it's your time. You've got to do what I've called you to do. You've got to be faithful in what I've called you. Because I love you. And I've got a job for you. And it may not be the way you expect. It may not be what you want. But it'll be sweet. And it'll be good. And the Bible tells us that Gideon goes back and he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitcher. So every man got a trumpet and every man got a, a pitcher and it was a uh, something that had been made, you know, pottery and they put a candle down inside it so that you couldn't see it when it was burning but they could get enough oxygen from the top so that it would still burn. And all the 300 men gathered around the area of the Midianites on top of the mountains. And he, notice he says, he beat down the tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. He took the elders and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkot. That's, that's a little bit later. And uh, the Bible tells us here in verse number 17, He said unto them, Look on me, and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall you do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Notice who they put first. The Lord. The Lord should always be put first. When we talk about anything, give God the glory. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. <coughs> Excuse me. I remember Brother Johnny Thompson in our Old Testament class. He'd always carry a stick in the class. 
and he enacted this, a one-man actor, and he was showing, he was bouncing around in the room, you know, like the 300 on top of the mountaintops, and he had a thing that looked like a, a pottery vessel, and they all had, had a, you know, a light in them, and he was saying, they all held that light up, they blew their trumpets, and then they broke them, and you could clearly see the light, and hear the trumpet, and the Midianites thought, look up there, there are 300 bands of men, when there was really only one man with a trumpet and a pitcher. But that's not even the marvelous thing. The Bible says, verse 19, So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpet, break the pitchers, held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hand, to blow withal, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpet, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah, in Zeroth, and to the border of Ahelmoholah, unto Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto Beth Barak and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barak and Jordan. And they took, took princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zia, and they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zia they slew at the winepress of Zia and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb, Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. Now these two princes, they were the uh, leaders, the assumed leaders, and notice where they put them to death. They took them to the places where they were known for. They took the first one, Oreb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. So evidently there was a big rock that had been carved out to his honor uh, as the leader of the Midianites. And then Zeb, they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian. So what does God teach us here? He teaches us that we don't have to be big. We have to be little. If you want to be used of God, don't gloat in your flesh. Don't talk about how great you are, Amen. what a wonderful person you are, what a great singer you are, that you're this great preacher and you're this great that and the other. Sometimes I, I hear men preach and I hear people say, oh, that was a masterpiece. But there's only one problem. In the whole sermon, I never felt the Spirit of God. All I heard was a bunch of rhetoric and a bunch of oratory and boasting and bragging on who they were and what they've accomplished and all of that. I remember one time many years ago after I'd finished my uh, degree, my graduate degree in college, and I went somewhere to preach and somebody was talking about, you know, me getting my degree and uh, and they introduced me, you know, like I was some big wig. And I got up and I said, listen, I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. I'm, I'm a big zero. And if it wasn't for God, I would be in hell right now. So don't start bragging about me or talking about me because I'm nothing. It's God. 
It's God. He's done it all. He lifted me up from the miry clay and set my feet on the solid rock. And He's done the same thing for you. You are what you are by the grace of God. The Apostle Paul spoke seven languages fluently. He studied under Gamaliel. He said as touching the law, he was blameless. But you know what he said? He said, I'm less than the least of all the saints. He said, I am the chief of sinners. When we get this elevated ego where we you know, want to pronounce how great we are, then you're just closing the door on God ever using you. Because God's not looking for big people. He's looking for little people. He's looking for those who will say, Lord, here I am. Use me. I'm nothing. But with you, I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. Thank you, dear Father, for your blessings. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray that you would take this lesson and apply it in our hearts. That every day, Lord, we would give you all the glory and all the honor. And we would make it a point when we talk to people to put you at the forefront. To glorify your holy name. To never be ashamed to let it be known that I am what I am by the grace of God. And had the Lord not rescued this poor old sinner, I'd be on my way to hell. But thank you, Lord, that you love me, that you saved me. Thank you that you give me the privilege to bow at your feet and to be your obedient servant. Father, we pray your will be done in each of our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.